The only constant in life is change. The only constant in life is change. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus said this 25 centuries ago, but it seems that it rings more true today than it had ever before. And also, ladies and gentlemen, we are in Athens, the city where philosophers once roamed the Agora, debating the nature of existence. So being here, I'd like to invite you on to join a journey with me uh, to discuss the future of work, redefine collaboration, and also talk what the new definition of success. When I started my professional career over 10 years ago, um, things looked dramatically different than they look today. This was my work computer, and this is a picture from the actual office I worked in. So as you can see, it was a small uh, and not greatly performing desktop computer. And also to make calls, uh, I actually had to use this landline phone to call other people onto their desk. Uh, so it's not like today where we have laptops and we can travel everywhere and basically work from anywhere if you want. Design sessions. Well, we didn't use Miro back then. Uh, we used the whiteboards. Um, so in order to design something and to work together, we were just huddled in this small conference room with markers in hands, drawing things on a whiteboard. Handling tickets. Well, Jira was not that popular back then. So actually, uh, our work and work tracking was centered around this physical board in our office, where we moved tickets from in progress to done. Remote work. Remote work back then was a luxury that happened maybe once a month, if your manager allowed it, and it was rather an exception. And on top of that, to work remotely, we had to actually connect to our desktop, which was on our desk, using remote desktop connection. Not the most convenient remote work setup to have. So, who am I and why am I here? I've been working for the last 13 years, I've been working in the tech industry. For the last nine, I've been a manager. And the uh, recent four years, uh, I've actually worked remotely and with remote teams. And I'd like to use those experiences and share them with you to inspire you and open a discussion how the future of work will look like. So I already know, you already know why I'm here, but I'd like to know why you are all here. So let me ask you a question. How many of you in this room work remotely or most remotely? Please raise your hands. Okay, good. So it's, it seems like I'm having remote crowds uh, listening about remote work. Okay, let's check this. How many of you in the room work in a hybrid setup like you're in the office once, twice a week at least. Okay, great. And how many of you work mostly from the office with remote work being an exception? Okay, okay. So thank you uh, for this small experiment. The overall statistics in reality, according to quite recent data, uh, look like this. So. Remote work is still being not the most popular type of work setup. Hybrid work, more or less 25%, the rest of people working from the office. But let me ask you another thing. Do you actually like working remotely? Meaning, uh, would you like to have an opportunity to work remotely at least part of the time, uh, whatever, in your whatever current or future job, please raise your hand. Okay, more or less, it's more or less aligned to the data from one survey checked. 81% um, of people would like to have an opportunity to work remotely at least part of their time. 
So, starting with this, I'd like to tell you a bit what I'm going to talk about. Uh, first, I'd like to invite you to this small historic journey about the remote revolution and talk a bit about the history of work and history of humanity. Then, I'd like to share my experiences about related to working with remote teams. And at the very end, we'll just sum everything up. So, the remote revolution. But let's travel a long time ago to the beginning of humanity. Um, how this all started. So, at the very beginning, the work model, as we can call it, was the hunter-gatherer work model. Basically meant that people in small groups would travel from place to place, hunting for animals, searching for food. Then, we learned to farm our crops. Uh, so we were able to create societies and be tied to one region, which allowed us to make a leap as people. Next, industrial revolution, right? We invented steam engines and we were able to uh, boost manufacturing, like allowing us to produce more and more stuff. Finally, the information age. We invented computers and work got centered more around information than physical goods. Mm. Lastly, it seems like recently we're entering a new era, which is the remote first age. So gradually, the work is not tied to a specific place because more and more work and more jobs are able to be done from any location using computers and remote connection. How did it look in the more, more recent period? So if we look at remote work popularity in the US from the 60s, actually people have been working remotely already in the 60s, but the nature of this work was slightly different than today. It was more like craftsmen working from their home, not working on computers. And the popularity of remote work started dropping. But then, in the 80s, uh, when we invented internet and computers got more popular as well, connections got better, remote work changed its nature and was more centered around working with computers. Uh, so the popularity started growing again. And probably this trend will continue um, up to today with more or less the same pace, if not the pandemic. We all know that during the pandemic, we started working remotely, we went working from home, whether we wanted or not. Some companies were, had better preparations, some had not, but the fact is, looking at the data from the US, that the amount of remote workers compared to times before, just before the pandemic, grew 10 times. So the popularity of war, remote work, well, naturally increased. But when the pandemic was over, we all know what happened, right? We all know what happened recently. We all saw the headlines. Netflix, no more remote work. We want you to go back to the office. Amazon says, go back to the office. Tim Cook from Apple called the remote work the mother of all experiments, but that said, still wants workers to go back to the office. Google finally tells people it's been fun, but let's get back to the office, shall we? Zoom, a company that creates software for remote work, basically says, yeah, but let's get back to the office. Meta, the same. So, is it all over? Is there even a reason to talk about remote work anymore? Well, actually there is, because even though we sort of got back to the office to some degree, uh, it changed the landscape of work. If we look at the big tech companies, um, some of them moved to remote first approach, some of them moved to hybrid. But, what do you actually mean by hybrid? I asked you before, do you work in a hybrid model? But I wasn't very precise. And that's because 
hybrid is not a very specific definition. So let's explore the definition of remote hybrid office work because it's actually a spectrum. So we can talk about full remote setup. Full remote meaning you work remotely all the time, maybe occasionally seeing people in real life. Then, when we move closer to the office setup, we have hybrid and remote first, meaning there might be some office available to the employees, but still work is remote. People can come if they want, but don't have to or are not even actively encouraged to do so. Next, hybrid and office occasional, meaning we work kind of remotely, but people are either strongly encouraged or forced to come to the office once or twice a week. Um, next, there's office, hybrid and office first, meaning that we basically work from the office, but sometimes if people really want it, they can work remotely. And of course, there's also the traditional work from the office model. So for the context of my presentation, I'm gonna call these the remote work, and I'm gonna call those the non-remote setup. So everything that I'm gonna call remote applies to the first three models. But we talked about the history and what's ahead. If we look at remote work popularity, of course it has been growing since the pandemic, then returned to the office and it was falling. But very recently, the trend is changed again. And um, I would say that remote work is gonna get more and more popular in the future. So let's talk about unlocking the power of remote teams how we can do this. So there are three pillars of remote excellence, three areas I like to think about when thinking about optimal remote work. First is efficiency. Efficiency is about creating optimal work processes designed for remote work that use all the benefits of remote setup. Second, alignment. Alignment means having common understanding of goals, common understanding of how we do things. And third is autonomy. Autonomy being crucial, not only in the remote work setup, of course, but in the remote setup, it's even more important because we have less control, less direct communication, and the work is more distributed by nature. So let's talk about efficiency, shall we? In the remote setup, we have better focus, right? When we're working from home, we have less distractions. Do we actually focus better at home? Well, according to research, yes. Working from home, we have more focus time and we have less distraction. Distractions, distractions. So, great, right? Well, it's great, unless, unless it looks like this. We need to do something at work. So what do we do? Well, let's schedule a meeting, right? But then the meeting is over and we haven't fully covered the topic. So what do we do? Let's schedule another meeting. And then finally somebody raises their hand and says, hey, we got too many meetings. So let's schedule a meeting to solve the problem of meetings. Well, of course, it doesn't look like that in reality usually, but we all have meetings, right? This is actually a problem. Are meetings that problem? Well, it depends. It depends on the nature of work you do in your role. When we are talking about the managers, uh, which I broadly call the group uh, doing either engineering management, product management, or either communication coordination related type of work. We kind of used to this, that we have a lot of meetings. We do a lot of context switching, whether we want it or not. This is the nature of work. 
However, when we talk about makers, so the people that do creative work, like software engineers, the ideal work schedule should look like this. We start our morning, go and focus deeply on our task. Oh, there's a lunch break, and then we get back to our work, right? But if we've got meetings, it looks like this. We just have a short focus block in the morning, and then before we even start working on the task, actually, there's a meeting. After the meeting, there's context switching. We haven't really done too much. There's a lunch break. And then, again, some blocks for work, but another meeting, more context switching. It's not optimal, is it? And there are also other distractions, uh, like this. Hey, hey, I found a bug. How do I report it? Or other questions uh, people ask you. But are those distractions? Well, it depends. Uh, it depends whether those things would actually distract you, but I'm gonna cover this in a couple of slides. My point is that every interruption has a cost. If you compare people that work on a task uh, without any distraction with people that work on the same task being distracted with some interruptions, the frustration grows, the stress increases, and on top of that, it takes on average 23 minutes to get back to the task you had to interrupt with your full attention and full focus. So it's, the, it's a waste of time, right? And time is money. So what can we do about this? we can and we should try replacing the synchronous workflows with asynchronous ways of communication. And I just want to give you a couple of examples of specific things which I found the most crucial and most important for creating async workflows. First, the knowledge base. This might be obvious, however, in the remote setup, it's much more important than for regular teams. Uh, re knowledge base should be a central place where we gather all the information important for the team, whether this is technical documentation, process descriptions, any proposals, agreements, basically anything that should be available to the team members. And creating a proper knowledge base can also allow us to reduce distractions by questions. We need less communication if things are, if information is available on demand. Um, instead of asking people, you can just check it somewhere. Next, do we actually need meetings to agree on proposals and change things? Not necessarily. For some things at least, we can prepare a written document with a proposal and ask people to review it in a synchronous manner by adding comments, having discussions, and maybe we're gonna be able to align without having a single meeting. But even if we do, the meeting is gonna be more efficient, more focused because people will come prepared. Making decisions. Definitely we don't need meetings for every single decision, do we? Some of the decisions can be done asynchronously. We can, it can be as simple as creating a poll on Slack uh, or maybe having some additional discussion in a synchronous manner using comments so that people can reply when they want and when it's convenient instead of pulling them out of their current task and making them attend the meeting. And lastly, Slack. Slack for asynchronous communication. Whether Slack is asynchronous or synchronous, it depends on you and depends on how do we agree in the team, but I'm gonna talk about this in a second in the alignment section. Uh, Slack offers you a lot of tools that actually can help you work more asynchronously. One example uh, I'm showing here is Slack short clips feature, which allows you to record short videos of your screen with some commentary you can then send to people. Um, so instead of having a meeting when you share your screen and ask for people commenting live, you can just send it and ask for asynchronous comments. But what about the meetings? Well, probably we're not gonna avoid all the meetings, but if we're gonna do meetings, 
let's just do them well. First of all, let's require clear agenda and meeting goal to prevent meetings to turn uh, into um, a never-ending discussion. Secondly, respect the time box. Finish meetings on time. Let's respect our time and time of other people. Also, select relevant participants. By, and by relevant, I mean the minimum number of participants, which is actually required to have the meeting. And when we're inviting people, let's know why are we inviting them for this meeting. Don't just play random participant roulette. Uh, also, we should avoid ad hoc meetings as much as possible. Uh, ideally, we should deal with things on the meetings which we have already scheduled in a regular manner because then our schedule is more consistent and it's easier to plan our day. This is super important, stacking your meetings. So the more grouped the meetings are, the less fragmented the focus time gets. So we should try to group the meetings as much as possible. No meeting days. By the way, how many of you here have tried having no meeting days in your teams? Please raise your hand. Okay, definitely less people that are working remotely. Uh, so, no meeting days, doesn't make sense. Uh, I have to say that when we first introduced no meeting days in my first team, I was also quite skeptical because I didn't think it's the proper solution to the problem. However, we tried it and it was great. And also, if you look at the research, having just one no meeting day a week would increase people's autonomy. If you ask people, they will say they have much more autonomy. It will increase engagement and also people just like them. With all this said, let's do a very quick live calendar improvement exercise. So imagine this is your team's calendar, which looks like this. And the work slots look like this. I mean, there's technically time to do your work, right? But there's con constant context switching all the time. So how can we improve this? First of all, let's remove the meetings that can be dealt with, I mean, the, the meeting goals can be met with asynchronous ways of communicating. I mentioned before, if we in introduce all of that, we're not going to need those. Okay, it's better now. Now, maybe we have this one long week refinement, uh, which actually sometimes finishes earlier, and but we need to do a separate refinements on other days, more ad hoc. Let's just split it into multiple shorter refinements and group that with our daily meeting. Let's also move those meetings and finally introduce no meeting day. And by no meeting day, I mean no meetings at all. So this is how our work slots look like. It's better, isn't it? And everybody's happy with that setup. So that said about efficiency. Let's cover alignment. So when we have our efficiency fixed, we can focus on alignment. And what do I mean by alignment? Alignment is shared goals and objectives, uh, which means the objectives are clear, the why is clear, and it's obvious to everyone why are we doing something and what are we actually doing. Next, effective communication protocols. So it should be clear to everyone, how do we communicate, what tools do we use, and what are the rules related to communication. Unified work processes, same thing goes for processes. It should be obvious for everyone, how do we work, how do we deal with certain things, and described in the knowledge base. Cultural and value alignment, this refers to company and team cultural values. So values would be the foundation of all of the cooperation. We should make sure we are aligned on the value level, both when it comes to teams, but also on the company level, we should make sure the people we hire match our cultural values. And regular feedback loops, um, both on team level, company level, we should frequently check where do we stand and make adjustments based on that. But in general, we should start with why. 
And the why means starting from the very, very broad, from the very top, and at the top there's vision. Our company should have a big vision, the reason why the company exists at all. Then we have the mission. Mission is more specific a uh, definition of how are we planning to reach our vision. And finally, strategy. Strategy is more of a set of specific steps and even more specific things we'd like to do um, by either producing specific hardware, for example, to reach our mission. Objectives. Objectives are something which we would plan for maybe the following year. Uh, where, what do we want to do in the short term? So what are the more granular steps to reach our vision? And finally, the key results. The key results being a metric which helps us to know whether we realize, whether we reached our objectives or not. And key results can be a number, can be a metric, can be a true or false statement. And this should be clear to everyone on the company level and on the team level. Having all of this, we can talk about the how. And here I'd like to share some of the things that also help you to reach alignment. So I mentioned processes, um, but it's really super important. The more clear the processes and tools are and unified they are and described in knowledge base, the more alignment we have and the less people have to communicate with each other. So the information is available on demand and the way we do things is clear for everyone. Next, the team agreement doc. Every team ideally should have a team agreement or team charter or whatever you call it. It should be a document which um, has all the rules, the, all the social norms, all the work agreements, all the, even the core hours, so the hours where people should be available at work, gathered in a single document. So the rules are clear to everyone. And this will also really help with onboarding new people. And every agreement we do, like for example, of course, iteratively changing the, the process, should be reflected in team agreement instead of having this knowledge only in people's minds. And I mentioned communication protocols. We talk about Slack, right? Whether Slack is a distraction or not. It depends on you. If you require people to respond to every message immediately, then yes, it's going to be a distraction. But if we agree that a Slack message can be replied to in up to two hours, then people will, can continue focusing on their task and reply to Slack messages after they're done. Also, Another important thing related to alignment in the remote, set, team, remote setup is team bonding. So working remotely, we have less casual interactions with people. So it's important to remember that it's not just images on Zoom. These are actual people. So we should try to meet in real life with some cadence, let's say once a quarter in some location. And this time should be different than regular work time when we focus on spending time together, knowing each other, uh, or maybe planning some stuff, doing some brainstorming. Building relations, not only on the team level, but on the company level. Again, in the remote work, we have less interactions with people and we build, building relations is harder. So it's quite important to use every opportunity we have to build relations with other people, whether this is in the office, in some location, or just having intro one-on-ones on Zoom to associate people with some uh, image of an actual person. Feedback loops. And this uh, refers both to the team level, company, uh, but also to individuals. So on the company level or team level, we should feedback loops mean reviewing our goals, reviewing where we stand, and making adjustments based on that. When it comes to individuals, feedback loops means more frequent one-on-ones with your manager. Um, and um, frequent one-on-ones with your manager and also uh, having 
more feedback, uh, making sure the feedback is more explicit because in the remote setup, naturally we give less feedback because we have less ad hoc communication and cultural differences. Remote teams tend to be more distributed geographically. So naturally we have people from different countries and different cultures. And those things can cause a lot of misalignment with people. Some cultures, for example, would prefer very direct feedback. But for some cultures, very direct negative feedback would be considered inappropriate or even rude. So I would really recommend this great book by Erin Meyer uh, to create more cultural understanding in your organizations. Finally, autonomy. Autonomy, why is autonomy even important for remote teams? First of all, micromanaging is just harder. I mean, micromanaging is never good, uh, but in the remote setup, it's just more harder because there are way less ways of controlling things. Secondly, it maximizes productivity, and there's research for that. Autonomous teams tend to be more productive, and also, reduces stress and increases well-being, which is even more important in the remote setup where well-being is at higher risk than in a regular office setup. So how do we give people more autonomy? And again, I'm just going to share a couple of examples. Uh, so in general, we should focus on giving people more accountability and more ownership. How can we do that? Something that worked really well in all my remote teams was a role we introduced uh, called the feature owner. So while the product manager would still be accountable and responsible for the product part, a feature owner would have a part, a feature or a project, and this would be an engineer from the team, being the main responsible person on the team level, helping to execute the work, driving discussions, maybe splitting the work as needed, and also liaising with other teams if we need to collaborate. This not only helps to be more efficient, but also gives more space for people to grow. Meeting rotation. So whether those are scrum meetings or any other meetings we have, um, I would encourage you to introduce meeting rotation if you don't do that. If we have one person running all the meetings, let's say an engineering manager owning and running all the meetings, it causes problems. First of all, we have a single point of failure. Let's say the manager gets sick and then for two weeks there's chaos. People don't know how to run the meetings and why there are even four. And also having meeting rotation creates the sense of ownership and makes the team feel that they actually own the meetings and the process is there for them, not for that one person. So if the process is not appropriate, uh, we can change it and people won't change it, will change it. Delegation levels. So of course we talk about delegation. Delegation is good. Managers should delegate stuff. Uh, and that's true. In order to make it more explicit, what do we delegate and how do we delegate things? You can, we can use some model, like for example, from management 3.0, we have delegation levels defining to what extent do we delegate certain things. Do we delegate things fully, like not even wanting to know as a leader, or maybe we want some consultation and discussion. Mistakes. Well, the more accountability and responsibility we give, the mistakes will happen. And I really like the rule from Toyota production system, which is blame the process, not the person. So introducing a blameless culture is important because it encourages people to take more risk, to try new stuff. And if we're going to blame people for mistakes, they're going to be more cautious and not going to innovate as much. So let's create a blameless culture and create a process that prevents from making two severe mistakes. Finally, uh, I talked about uh, alignment before, and now I talked about autonomy, but what's the relation between autonomy and alignment? 
So to create a self-reliable, self-driven team, we need to have both. If we have none, of course, there's just a bunch of set people not knowing where to go. If we just have the autonomy, but there's no alignment, we're going to have a lot of motivated people wanting to do stuff, but they may just not know where they're going and why. If we have alignment, but no autonomy, it's going to end up in a dictatorship, basically a manager micromanaging the team, and the team results will be limited by manager's uh, capabilities and even his or her time. Um, so we need both to create a motivated and uh, self-organized team that can reach great results. And slowly reaching towards the end. So just summarizing what I said, the key takeaways. Firstly, create a lot of time for focused, uninterrupted work. This is the foundation for great remote teams. Also ensure that people know what the goals are, that they are clear, that they are available for them. And lastly, just trust, empower, and delegate things. And always remember, the only constant in life is change. Thank you. That's it from me. We thank you. So do we have any questions for we before we move on? So also, let me just, uh, I see people leaving the room. Please do not leave the room. We had a small slide of change in the presentation. Uh, our last speakers, we have one more we, parallel uh, presentations. Uh, the last speaker at the parallel room missed his flight, so he won't make it. So we're doing the last presentation of the program here. So please hang around. Any questions? Are you hanging around? Uh, there's, there's one question there. Thank you. Uh, that's actually a great question. Um, so the question was, so I repeated, how do we allow people for those ad hoc interactions between engineers, quickly solving problems and helping us to move forward? How can we maybe facilitate or organize it effectively in a remote setup, correct? Um, so for that, I actually tried, and I know people that tried various things to do it with more or less success, being as extreme in one company case where people were sitting on the Discord with their audio uh, on for the whole eight hours. But this was not the best uh, solution for that. I'm just mentioning this that you can try it if you want. Something that worked for my team uh, in a best manner um, is actually using Slack for that. We're using Slack. And Slack has this feature called Slack Huddle. Um, so we have a team channel. Uh, we also have sub-channels because in the team there are different roles, there are back-end engineers and mobile engineers. Uh, so when people want to talk about something, they just start a huddle or sometimes start with a message, I want to talk about this. If someone can join the huddle, please join me. Uh, and it's easier, it's less distracting because it's also on Slack, it's ad hoc, there are more people that can join. So people would jump on the huddle, other people know the huddle is going on, they may join if they want or not. Uh, and actually, we also do huddles on no meeting days. So those, uh, let's say, ad hoc interactions are not considered uh, meetings. And this is something in practical that works really great. Thank you. 
Any more questions? Does anybody maybe want to share what your experience was like during COVID working uh, from home? Was it good? What is, was it challenging? I mean, those of you with pets or small kids around, if you continue working at home, does that help? Okay, I see everybody's eager for our last speaker. Oh, there's a question, I think. If we still have time, I'm happy We do, to. we do, of course. Just stand up or lift your hand so we can see you, yes. And shout out so we can hear you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, good question. Actually, I was thinking about covering this in my presentation, but just decided to focus on other things. So the question was, are there traits or are there people which may be more or less suitable for remote work, um, or maybe companies um, in general um, suitable or less suitable for remote work, correct? Uh, so I wouldn't say there are specific traits in terms of personality traits. However, for remote work, uh, in fact, one thing is more difficult than remotely, and this is growing people and knowledge sharing. So, for example, growing junior people. So, first of all, it's easier to create great remote teams when we have higher seniority. But apart from seniority, it's also a factor of motivation. So, for some companies, uh, this won't work that well compared to smaller companies that may be more fancy startups which hire people with higher sense of motivation and purpose, because that's true. In remote work, we have less control. So that's why motivated and more senior people would usually do better. But apart from this, that's another separate topic. I don't want to elaborate too much, but in general, since we have less control in the remote setup, I mean, uh, less illusionary control, I would say, because we cannot see whether a person is sitting at their desk or not we have to create uh, better ways of assessing how people are doing, doing proper performance reviews. Um, and yes, that's why a lot of managers were initially pushing back on remote work because being in the office gives this illusionary sense of control. So the short answer is um, we should create specific outcomes, not measuring output, but measuring outcomes and judging people by outcomes they do. So basically, as a manager, I don't really mind if you go for a run in, in the middle of your day or you watch YouTube if you like after lunch. The results is, what, is all what matters because remote work is flexible by definition. Hopefully, I covered. So quality over quantity. Uh, let me remind you, uh, don't leave the room. Our next speaker is Abdel. Uh, so stay here. We're waiting for the guests from the other room to also join us. So we still have some time for questions or um, any comments that you would like to throw to ask. Otherwise, go outside. Give okay, yourself a I stretch. guess everybody needs a break. So I'm going to be around if you want to have a chat or discuss. I'm really happy to have a chat with you. Thank you for attending. And that's it.